So, um, just to remind you, as though you could forget, there is an exam that starts today in the testing center. You can take it today, tomorrow, or Monday. It's 25 questions long, 200 points. I always sort of struggle with two things. First, I don't want the test to be too long, but then if it's too short, the stakes are too high on each question, and I know you guys worry about that. Each question's worth eight points. That's as about as good as I can do in terms of the balance and still have you out of there in a reasonable amount of time. That being said, multiple choice allows me to go in after the fact if I feel like some answers deserve partial credit and I can do that retroactively and award partial credit to the whole class rather than to just those intrepid few souls who make their way to my office to ask. So anyway, it tends to work out better. I anticipate that it will take around two hours, plus or minus, depending on your own situation and how long you take on exams. If you have any particular university accommodations that we need to take care of, please uh, let me know. Time limit isn't an issue, but you do need to make sure you give yourself plenty of time before the testing center closes. And please pay attention to um, testing center hours, which are different in the spring term than they are in the fall. Yes? Is stuff we're learning today also, stuff we're learning today also on the exam? Yes. Chapter 4 is not. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've finished up with homo and lumo stuff. We've also basically finished up with the acid-base chemistry. I've painstakingly tried to show you how to get answers right on questions where I say, hey, we're throwing this molecule in a pH 7 solution. Which groups are positively charged and which groups are negatively charged? So, you know, I mean, how can I warn you more explicitly? There is at least a question on the exam about that kind of thing. Is that better? <laughs> so, that sounded, that laugh sounded evil. I apologize. It's not meant to sound evil. Um, okay. Today we're going to deal uh, with organic molecule nomenclature, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. And we're also going to deal with uh, alkene stereochemistry. So a word of warning at the beginning of nomenclature. This is a uh, tortuous, not torturous, but tortuous, twisted um, warren of rabbit holes that you could go down indefinitely. And there's a whole group of people that write the rules for naming organic compounds. They're called IUPAC for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. If there's a molecule, there's a rule for how to name it, but almost everybody stops caring um, at a certain point. And so you're going to find yourself uh, unsatisfied thinking, well, what if the molecule was like this? What if I made it a little bit more complicated? How would I name it then? And my answer to you is, I don't know, and I don't care. But you do need to know enough so that when we talk about it in class, you're not falling behind in the sense that you don't even know what molecule we're dealing with. So I'm going to teach you enough of the language for you to get by. Uh, it's going to be kind of like the amount of Spanish I learned on my mission to South Texas. I, I, thought, I, was speak I thought I spoke Spanish pretty well when I left the mission, but... Turns out mostly what I can do is testify of the truthfulness of the gospel rather than tell people where the grocery store is. So um, I'm not going to demonstrate. I really am not going to demonstrate. But you want to know enough so that you can uh, recognize and talk about molecules sensibly. The standard for nomenclature is, and, and uh, this will give you a sense for uh, how to get questions right on this subject, and what not to worry about. Can you draw the correct molecule? Can you draw the correct structure unambiguously from the name that you give it? And if you can, no problem. So um, let's go ahead and dig in. As we do that, we need to talk about uh, an interesting subject called functional groups. 
And the idea behind functional groups is actually really based in uh, homo and lumo types of arguments. But the basic idea is there are certain arrangements of atoms that have similar properties in multiple contexts. And so we consider them as a group rather than as individual atoms uh, because their properties are basically transferable. So one of them is the carboxylic acid. We consider this whole thing as a unit. And it is different It is different from uh, just a carbonyl compound, and it is also different from an alcohol. And the reason for that actually, based on chapter two, should be pretty clear, right? The, unlike a regular alcohol, if you remove that proton, the negative charge is stabilized by resonance. So uh, when you look at that, you need to train your eye and your brain to not see a ketone and to not see an alcohol, but to see a carboxylic acid, okay? Um, molecules that are carboxylic acids have uh, generally, uh, are generally named with the following suffix. We'll talk about this, and maybe you've read a bit about it. The suffix for the carboxylic acid name is oic acid. Uh, and we'll come back to that. But as an example, uh, the two carbon carboxylic acid would be called ethanoic acid, except nobody in their right mind says that. We just use its nickname, acetic acid. Or if you're in the kitchen, you call it vinegar which is even less descriptive. Okay, there are other functional groups that are similar to carboxylic acids in the sense that they have a carbon-oxygen pi bond, double bond here and then some other heteroatom, by that I mean something other than carbon or hydrogen, attached to this carbonyl carbon. So as an example, you have... Uh, this functional group. You've seen that before. Uh, I told you in peptide backbones we're going to ignore that. That's the amide functional group. Um, then you also have esters. In the ester you have uh, the oxygen of the carboxylic acid, but instead of a proton on that oxygen you have another um, another carbon group. It's not an ether because, and we'll talk about ethers in a minute, but it's not an ether because one of the carbons attached to oxygen also has a carbon-oxygen uh, double bond. Uh, if you have the thing that's attached to the carbonyl carbon be a halide, this is called an, like chloride, this is called an acid chloride. Um, and then there's one more, and that's called an anhydride, where you, it's like you have two uh, carbonyl groups attached to the same oxygen. We will not talk about the chemistry of these groups, uh, of these molecules other than the carboxylic acids. We won't talk about the chemistry of these other molecules in 351. You'll get that in 352. Um, there is, uh, in your study guide for chapter 3, there is a list of the appropriate suffixes for each of these. Um, the most common ones that you'll have to use will be um, the one for the carboxylic acid, the one for the esters, and the one for the acid chlorides. And hydrides and amides we typically don't uh, bother naming. Um, functional groups come in a list of priority. When we name molecules, we have to, in, in terms of what we put where, we have to choose which groups are most important and which groups are less important. And I'm going to list them today in order of priority, but I'm basically going to group them together. Group one, the, the common element in all of these is you tend to have three bonds between carbon 
and heteroatoms, electronegative heteroatoms. There's maybe one exception to this, but I don't care about it. So that'll be, that'll be good enough. Um, within this group, you generally will not need to worry about which groups are higher priority. There are rules <laughs> for that. Uh, there's rules about acids being higher in priority than esters, but I don't know them, really. And in, in practice, you almost never have to worry about that. If the molecule is complicated enough that it has two or more of these functional groups, chances are nobody in their right mind wants to name it anyway. Yes? What is a heteroatom? That means something that is not carbon or hydrogen. So organic chemists are carbon and hydrogen centric and everything else is something else so we call it a heteroatom. That's just sort of the lingo that we use. I'm sorry but it's it's sort of ingrained. Um, all right. So don't worry about the relative priority of acids versus esters versus acid chlorides. It will almost never come up. Yeah. Um, could I give you an example of a problem where I uh, give you, you, you would need to use this information? Sure. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six carboxylic acid. So what are we going to call this? A name has a root and a suffix and a prefix. The root tells you the number of carbons and the root will also tell you if there are any carbon-carbon pi bonds and if so where they are and what their stereochemistry is. The suffix will tell you about the highest priority functional group. I'm abbreviating that as FG. So um, in this case, the highest priority functional group is the carboxylic acid. Uh, we don't have anything other than that, any competing functional group. So the suffix for this molecule is going to be oic acid. Uh, the root, we count the number of carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we use, I don't know whether they're Greek or Latin-ish, uh, they're not really actually any, uh, for, uh, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. Uh, if there's one carbon, meth, if it's two carbons, eth, if it's three carbons, prope, four carbons, bute, um, five carbons, pent. At this point, we switch to prefix or, or, or a number things that make sense. Six carbons, hex, seven carbons, hept, and so on. Um, the, so the root tells you the number of carbons, and then if you don't have any double bonds, you use... Ane. So methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane. That's the, the root has two parts. One tells you the number of carbons. And the second part tells you alkane or an alkene or an alkyne. And in this case, there's no double bonds, no pi bonds, so uh, we use the suffix ane. Okay? Is that right? So, and there are no other functional groups, so there's no uh, prefix here. So, our, the suffix that we've chosen is oic acid. The root that we've chosen should be this way, this one and there is no, no prefix here. So the name of this molecule would be heptaneoic acid. And for, for some reason, I don't care, the, the E is not, I mean, this is one of these rules that I don't care about. Um, you drop the E technically because, I don't know, we have something against three vowels together or something, so just slide that over, heptanoic acid. But, um, I'm seriously not interested in writing a multiple choice question where the two answers are the same except there's an E in one and not in the other, right? That just, 
we could do it, but it would be dumb. Okay, so that's that's a simple molecule. Go ahead. Okay, so good question. Uh, what if we had an alkene in there? So let's just take the simple molecule and let's keep the same number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Same number of carbons. Only let's put um, a double bond here. All right. So... Uh, again, identify the highest, pri oops, highest priority functional group, uh, which is the oic acid. So we already know what the suffix is going to be, right? Uh, in terms of the root, you've got part one, which is going to be hept. Part two is going to tell us whether there's any double bonds. There's one. So instead of ain, we're going to use een. Okay? Um, other than that, uh, there's no prefix. So what is it informative enough to call this heptene-oic acid? And if you want to drop the e, that's fine. I really don't care. What's wrong with calling it just heptene-oic acid? I have no idea where the double bond is, right? Okay, so I need a way to say where the double bond is in relation to where the highest priority functional group is. Fortunately, we know how to count. So um, one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, six carbons, seven, seven carbons. Ah, ah, ah. No, Sesame Street. Sesame Street maybe was before your time. I don't know. Um, okay, so to, to specify where this double bond is, we're going to take, as you can see, the pi bond is between carbons uh, 4 and 5. The, we're going to use the lowest of those two numbers as the location of the double bond, and we're going to put it in the root. Now there's two places we can put it and uh, and so I'll show you how to do that. One option is hept 2 enoic acid or in this case because there's no confusion whatsoever about where the highest priority functional group is the only way to have a carboxylic acid is to have it on carbon one we can actually put the two out in the front two huh oh right i don't know why i'm thinking two <laughs> i'm gaslighting you guys it's it's seriously it's on carbon two what's wrong with you people heptene Oic acid. <laughs> Sorry. Ugh. All right. Are we done? Does that tell us the molecule completely? Um, okay. So let me draw a potential alternative and you tell me whether we can see based on our name, whether we can see what the difference between the two is. Okay, are those two the same molecule? Okay, their shape is different. Um, but what about here? Uh, let's see. Are these two the same molecule? Yes. Yes. Well, why? Because they both have different shapes. So what's the big difference? Why are these two the same, but these two are not? Okay, what is it about a double bond? Pi bond what? Pi bond restricts rotation. Is that a familiar concept to everybody? Okay, but why? Because they told you, right? But why? Okay, 
Right. So remember that a pi bond comes from side-by-side -side overlap of uh, p orbitals on each of those sp2 carbons. Okay. And in order for this to actually be a bond, they have to line up side by side. So I'm going to show you what this side by side uh, overlap looks like. Um, we're going to put our, we're going to lean down into the page and sort of put our eyeball in the page with our nose pointing in this direction um, because we are tired. Um, oops, we need, and because it's close to May the 4th. We're going to have sort of evil Sith eyes. Yeah. And um, let's see what we would look, what we would observe if we looked uh, down the bond, this double bond, okay? So I'm going to draw a circle here. This is going to represent the carbon that's in the front and on the other end in the back is going to be the carbon that's in the back. In the front, if I'm leaning down into the page, I'd have the R group coming out to my right and the hydrogen coming out to my left and then in the back I would have the other R group and the other hydrogen. Uh, we'll learn more about this view of molecules. It's called the Newman projection, but basically we're looking down this carbon-carbon bond. And what we would see in terms of the orbitals is there's a p orbital on the carbon in the front mixing with the p orbital on the carbon in the back. And um, they are lined up side to side with the same wave function sign. So you get, whoops, so you get a favorable bonding interaction that we've talked about before, and that is the pi bond. Okay. Fair enough. Well, what if we were to rotate uh, the carbon in the front? So let's take that carbon in the front. The one in the back is going to stay exactly there. And let's just go ahead and rotate uh, around that carbon-carbon bond. Uh, doing so presumably would get us to this state where the groups are trans to each other. Okay, and presumably the p orbitals could still line up side by side with the same wave function sign and you could still have a pi bond there. But the intermediate, or rather the, 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 there's a high energy structure through which you have to pass, and that is the following structure where the atoms in the back are still where they used to be, but the R group in the front is now perpendicular to the R group in the back. And this does some crazy things to our bonding. So the P orbital in the back is there, the P orbital in the front is here. And uh, one thing that we maybe didn't talk about, but I think was in your MO theory study guide is that when orbitals for side to side overlap, orbitals have to line up parallel to each other. If they're perpendicular to each other, there's really no interaction. Um, think of it as a vector type of quantity and the cosine of 90 is zero and that's an important term somewhere along the lines. Anyway, Two orbitals can't interact with each other when they're 90 degrees apart. So there's no interaction, and therefore there is no pi bond. So in order to go from cis to trans, even though in terms of sterics, trans would be uh, lower in energy, you have to go through this high energy transition state where you literally break the pi bond. Okay. Um, I'm drawing an energy landscape where the x-axis represents how far we've rotated around this carbon-carbon bond and we have this high energy transition state 
and the difference in energy uh, is about the strength of a pi bond. So you literally have to break the pi bond to go from cis to trans. I've exaggerated the energy difference between cis and trans here, so I'm going to try again. Trans is just a little bit more stable than cis for reasons we'll talk about. Okay, so this is why you can't rotate around double bonds, at least not at room temperature. Yeah? When you like flip all the way around, why wouldn't it be problematic if it's like opposite wave function? If you flip it all the way around, would it be problematic because it's opposite wave function? Um, my short answer to that is no, because remember, you've also got the pi star, and you flip that around, and now they're lined up correctly. Does that sort of make sense? Um, alternatively, uh, wave, wave function sign is not, well, it's not a permanent thing. What we want to consider is both possibilities. They're lining up. Same sign lining up opposite sign. You get the pi and the pi star. Both are going to exist. The problem is, is uh, that when you get to that 90 degree sort of rotation, the orbitals don't overlap anymore. So you don't have two pi bonds anymore. You just have two. You don't have a pi and a pi star. You just have two p orbitals. Yeah. Go ahead. So if I understand the point correctly, because of this, the second molecule that you drew is not viable, and therefore we can call it four heptanoids. So, um, so the question is, if you can't rotate around pi bonds, does that mean this molecule is not viable? No, it just means it's different from this one. What we mean by all of this is there's not enough energy at room temperature to, to rotate around this bond to interconvert this molecule with this molecule. They can't interconvert. So they're different. And that means our name has to specify which we're talking about. If they could interconvert at room temperature, then they're the same molecule. But if they can't, then yeah, then they're different. Um, so the we'll learn about this in chapter four. But rotation around single bonds is totally fine. And that's because sigma bonds come from end-on-end -end overlap of orbitals. And you can rotate till you're blue in the face, and you don't change any of the orbital overlap when, you, when it's end-on-end. -end. It's only side-by-side -side overlap that you have problems with rotation. OK, so if, if we can't interconvert, if we can't interconvert, um, these two molecules at room temperature, then therefore they are different. The little three dots here is not necessarily Bilbo Baggins's dotting of the I, but rather I use, I think it's a mathematical thing, at least I learned it in geometry when we're doing proofs in ninth grade, it means therefore. It's just easier to write than therefore. Therefore they are different different molecules. Okay. Now, if we compared their molecular formulas, they have the same molecular formula. So that means that the relationship between these two is that they are isomers. And there's multiple kinds of isomers. Uh, if molecules that have the same atoms, but different arrangement of those atoms, rather different bonds between those atoms, different connectivity. Those are just isomers. For example, um, these two molecules, oops, no, one, two, three, four. These two molecules are isomers of each other. Um, sometimes people call them constitutional isomers because their connectivity is different, and that's fine. Other people will call them regioisomers. But if you compare these two molecules, they have the same connectivity. In other words, uh, carbon 1 has a carboxylic acid. There's a pi bond between 4 and 5. All the other atoms are bonded to each other in the same way. But they're still different. 
and the difference has to do with the 3D arrangement of the molecule. So that's a different kind of isomer. These would be constitutional isomers or just plain old isomers. If they have the same connectivity but different uh, 3D arrangement of groups and they're not interchangeable uh, by rotation, we're going to call them stereoisomers. Okay, so those two are stereo, stereo for 3D and isomer for being the same atoms, same molecular weight, same connect. Uh, uh, stereo tells you same connectivity but different arrangement of groups in space. Stereoisomers. Uh, just as a preview, there are two different kinds of stereoisomers. We will um, deal with this in Chapter 5, so don't worry about it yet but we will call this particular situation of stereoisomers, we'll call them diastereomers. And basically that accounts for most stereoisomers. There's another kind, but we'll deal with that in chapter five. Stereoisomers, then we have to have a way of communicating which one we mean. All right, any questions about sort of the lingo that we've set up here? Okay. So you probably learned in general chemistry that you could call this trans because the two groups that are not hydrogen are opposite each other. And then you could call the ones where they're on the same side of the double bond cis. And that's fine and that will work. Uh, we will see though that that terminology will break down once we start having double bonds with more than two things attached. Okay, so it would be totally fine for us to call this molecule cis for heptene oic acid, and it would be totally fine, oh, which one, right? <laughs> the one at the bottom, it would be totally fine for us to call this one cis for heptene oic acid acid. Where did the E go? I don't know. I'm being inconsistent. I really don't care. Um, and then over here we would call this trans-4-heptene-oic acid. Um, and from those names you've got the structure unambiguously. Okay. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, could I have drawn this any other way? Sure. One, two, three, four, five, six, four, five. Let's see, we said it was trans. One, two, three, four. Yep, that's fine. Frankly, we could also have done something like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like any rotation around double bonds is just fine. Whoa, back that up, scratch that for the record. Any rotation around single bonds is just fine. Ah. Do you need a minute to go back and erase that in your brain? Any rotation around single bonds is fine, not around double bonds. Dang it. Okay. Um, while we're on the subject of cis and trans, uh, we ought to talk about how you describe molecules that are uh, double bonds where the situation is more complicated than cis and trans. So let's take the same starting molecule. And let's put a uh, Let's put an ethyl, another ethyl group on carbon four. One, two, three, four, rather carbon five, six, seven. In this case, it doesn't matter whether we number 
this way or this way, we get the same length of chain. So uh, let's see how our uh, name changes. We're still going to keep the heptene oic acid with the four to tell us where the double bond is. Uh, we now need a prefix, and the prefix is going to be about where about any of the substituents that we haven't already accounted for. Substituent means a group coming off the main chain. It's a sub, it's, it's, we've substituted one of the hydrogens that used to be on carbon five with this group. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, you start numbering from the highest priority functional group, which was the carboxylic acid. And that highest priority functional group gives you your suffix. The ene part comes from the fact that we have this double bond. And the four tells us where that is. We're going to deal with the stereo isomer issue in a moment. But for now, uh, groups coming off the main chain, we then name based on various prefixes, which are also in that sheet that you can look at in your uh, study guide. Alkyl groups coming off the main chain, we number that we, we give them their prefix, we use the, the term for the, from the roots for the correct number of carbons and so on. But instead of an ane, we'll add I or YL. So a methyl group, an ethyl group, a propyl group, a butyl group, or so on. This has two carbons in it, so we're going to call this an ethyl group, and it's on carbon five, so we need to add as a prefix five ethyl. Now, look at that name, and look at the molecule. Does that name tell me unambiguously how to draw that molecule? You're not sure. Your instinct says no, because with double bonds you said, I, I need to do cis versus trans. But imagine switching, imagine switching to a, a situation where the proton was here on carbon. Instead of being pointing down, the proton was here, and this group was pointing down. Is that the same molecule or different? It's the same because on carbon-5, you have two of the same group. That means you can no longer tell which side of the double bond you're on. So that's an interesting principle. If one of the two carbons that's in the double bond is bonded to two of the same things, you can forget about cis and trans. This is why we also don't worry about, uh, we could do a related molecule that's a constitutional isomer, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's put the double bond there. We can call that seven heptene oic acid. And there's no reason for cis or trans because you got two of the same group there. So it's the same either way, okay? That makes sense. If you've got two of the same group on one of the carbons of the double bond, there's no stereochemistry. There's no isomers to worry about. Yeah. Um, the lower number for what? Oh, you're exactly right. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, minus one for me. Right, we'd call that six, heptinoic acid. Thank you. All right. So let's now uh, muddy the waters a little bit. Let's take that same molecule, but instead of an ethyl group, let's do a propyl group. Okay, so um, I know I still have my carboxylic acid. Right there. 
I know I still have my double bond, and I know I've got a substituent, but one thing we need to check right here is uh, the, the carbon chain that we're going to number is the longest one that contains the highest priority functional group. So whereas before we said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we've actually got a longer route up here on top. And so we're going to number to carbon five, and then we're going to number six, seven, and eight. <clears throat> okay, so now it's an octenoic acid, and the double bond is between carbons 4 and 5, and there is an ethyl group on carbon 5. But is what we've drawn to the left the same or different... versus what we've drawn on the right. What do you think? Same or different? Different, different because those two things on carbon five are not, are not the same. So there's a difference between whether you have uh, See over here, carbon three and carbon six are cis to each other. Over here, carbon three and the ethyl group are cis to each other. That's a different situation. So now we need to have a way to distinguish those two. However, cis and trans sort of uh, break down for us here. Uh, we can use cis and trans, but those are relative terms between two groups. So notice I said molecule uh, atom 3 and atom 6 are cis to each other. We're on the same side of the double bond. But atom 3 is trans to this one. Over here, atom 3 is cis to the ethyl group, but is trans to carbon 6. So we have to, cis and trans break down because they only describe the relationship between two groups. And once you've got three or more attached to the carbons of a double bond, which, which two are you talking about? And I suppose they could have generated a family of rules where we came up with a name that in parentheses I say here, um, I'm talking, I'm going to call this cis, but in so doing I'm talking about the relationship between groups three and six. And that's a lot of words. So instead, they developed a system whereby with a single letter, we can say which isomer we have. And the two letters I'm going to show you are, the letters are put in parentheses ahead of the molecule. And uh, the correct letter for the one that I've drawn here is Z. And um, the other isomer is called E. Those are from German words. Uh, and a lot of the organic chemistry uh, that was done, you know, 100 years ago was done in Germany. Um, and so some of the naming conventions are still German. I think E is for... Entgegen, which I think means maybe opposite or apart. And then Z is for Zutzamen, which means like together. Or you can say they are on the same side of the double. Um, okay. So how do we assign E versus Z? This is important. Your text does not deal with it at this point. It waits till chapter 10. We're going to deal with it now because I don't want to talk about it again. <laughs> and because it's going to actually come up in chapters 7 and 8. So um, what you do to assign stereochemistry, to assign a stereochemistry description, what I mean about... <clears throat> sorry. When I say stereochemistry, I mean a description of the stereoisomer, okay? 
we want a, a, a description that is absolute, that doesn't depend on us specifying which groups that we're talking about. So here is the process for assigning stereochemistry to the double bond. Conceptually, you're going to, and I'm going to now erase these numbers because uh, we're going to need to get in here and label some things. Conceptually, you're going to split the double bond into two pieces, carbon four on one side and carbon five on the other side. Okay? We're going to consider carbons four in first and then consider carbon five. Uh, and we're going to ask, of the two things attached to carbon-4, which has higher priority? Yes. Yeah, so, but let's talk about what the rules are, because this is where people, yeah, no, you're right, but let's talk about what the rules are, because this is where people tend to get confused. Um, so, in, uh, there are rules for assigning priority of atoms, and the, the process is to compare, first you ask what atoms are bonded to carbon-4. Well, here we have a carbon, and there we have a hydrogen. Then we compare those two atoms. Which is heavier? Is it carbon or hydrogen? Well, that's easy. It's carbon. So carbon becomes the bigger priority group uh, on carbon-4. And so this, when we give this double-bonded descriptor, everybody's going to know that we're talking about this carbon instead of this hydrogen. Now, on carbon-5, we do an the same kind of comparison. What are these two atoms? Well, one is carbon and the other is carbon. They have the same weight, so it's a tie. Fortunately, these people developed a tie-breaking procedure. Um, it's a bit like, it's, it's a weird accounting system. But what you do, the tie-breaking procedure after you compare the atoms, is you ask, what are these two carbons, what are each of these bonded to? And you write down what they're bonded to in order of heaviest to lightest. So the carbon up top that I've highlighted here is bonded to two other carbons and two hydrogens. Those two hydrogens are implied but not shown. Hopefully you're starting to see that or at least uh, keep track of it. The carbon on the bottom, however, is a big potato would like to share a photo. Decline. Uh, carbons. I think I need to hide myself on airdrop. Um, so... Uh, this carbon is also bonded to two carbons and two hydrogens. I go down the list one by one and I make a comparison and the first atom by atom and the first difference I find resolves the tie. However, in this case, uh, let's see, carbon and, whoops, I wanted to use a red X, carbon and carbon, that's a tie, carbon versus carbon, that's a tie. Hydrogen versus hydrogen, that's a tie. Hydrogen versus hydrogen, that's a tie. Okay, so we can't resolve it yet. So what we do next is we move out one more atom down the chain. And now we're going to look for differences. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Sorry, this carbon is bonded to this carbon and that carbon. Yep. Was that? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we move one atom out and we repeat the procedure starting with the atom's identity. In both of those cases, they're carbon. So we have to revert to our tie-breaking procedure. 
The carbon on the bottom here is bonded to only one other carbon and three hydrogens. The carbon up top is bonded to two other carbons and two hydrogens. Again, we make an atom by atom comparison, carbon and carbon, that's a tie. We go to the next one, carbon versus hydrogen. Whoops, yikes, where did everything go? We have a winner. And that means that uh, this group is the higher priority group. So now we've decided which two groups we're talking about. And now we ask, are those two priority groups on either side of the double bond cis to each other or trans to each other. If they're cis to each other, we call it Z. And if they're trans to each other, we call it E. Okay. So all of this was about deciding systematically and in rules everybody knows and follows, which are the two groups that we're talking about. And once you know that, then uh, if they're cis to each other, you call it Z, and if they're trans to each other, you call it E. Okay, questions about that? Yeah. If the ethyl group here, right. So, yeah, the question is, uh, and I'll do an example where that is, but if this atom were something heavier than carbon, this group would win automatically, even if there was other stuff back here. It's an atom by atom comparison. Now, one thing people misunderstand is, is they get the whole heavier versus lighter thing, and then they try to do math in their heads about the identity of the entire group. And if you do that, you will get the right answer sometimes, but for the wrong reason. And then in a pinch, you'll get the wrong, you'll get the wrong answer. So the procedure is not for me to say, okay, this is an ethyl group and this is a propyl group. The propyl group is bigger and heavier than an ethyl group. Therefore, the propyl group has priority. No, that, that isn't how you do it. You have to do this atom by atom comparison. Um, as, as an example, I'm going to take the same molecule. and I just want to show this to you uh, quick to demonstrate the point, and then we'll take... A break, but if I changed the molecule to an oxygen here, we would have still had the tie um, at the first carbons. But when we asked what are those two carbons bonded to, the one on the top is again bonded to two other carbons and two hydrogens. The one on the bottom is bonded to an oxygen a carbon and two hydrogens. In the first round of our tie-breaking procedure, oxygen wins. This group becomes the higher priority group. And we would say that double bond is now E. Yeah? What if one of them is bound to more things than another? Again, you would compare atom by atom, and which at some point you'll find one that's heavier than another. So um, an example there might have been, let's take the same molecule, but let's have the carbon on the bottom be bonded to three things. Or, yeah, let's have the carbon on the bottom be that tert-butyl group. Uh, in comparing which is higher priority, they would have been a tie at carbon, so we would examine what they're bonded to. The carbon in the bottom is bonded to four other carbons, whereas the one in the top is only bonded to two, and the other two are hydrogens. In the first two rounds of our tie-breaking procedure, it's a tie again, and then in the third round, there's a difference. I guess I mean like you didn't mean that. Yeah, 
Okay. A negative carbon? Okay. Uh, can you can you draw me an example? I can try and I'll come back. Okay. Yeah. Um, good. So let's take a minute and we'll come back and we'll practice this a little bit more.